Hello. Oh, I got a robot sound there. Hello, everybody. It's Doug Little from Wacom. Thanks for joining our Tuesday webinar here. We have a special guest, Joe Wost, the famous master maze maker. And uh, we'll get started in a few minutes as we let people come into the uh, webinar. Welcome and happy Tuesday. I'm still here. <laughs> yep. Oh, I know. I know. We're still here too. Don't worry. I'm okay, just let, I'm just letting some people come into the webinar before we get started. Okay, great. So we have a few more few more participants. Okay, it's still filling up a little a little slow, but uh, it's good. It's good. We're getting more people here, so that's great to see. Um, Anyhow, so let's get started. My name is uh, Doug Little. I am on the community team at Wacom, and um, we've been doing these webinars throughout the uh, pandemic, if you will, and it's been a lot of fun. It's a great way to get people uh, activated into the creative community, and uh, we're having a lot of fun with it. So um, I'd like to give a few housekeeping things first. Uh, generally, our webinars go for about an hour or so, um, and then uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and I'll interrupt Joe every now and then as he's talking and ask those questions or he can answer them as well. He, he has access to the Q&A also, so we can do it that way. But uh, let's give a, a, a round of applause for Joe. Joe is a, a great friend of Wacom. We've known him for a long time. Uh, he's been making mazes for kids and adults. I mean, let's face it, I, I love mazes too, so I, I don't think they're just for kids. Um, he, he's a syndicated cartoonist. He's done dozens of books, uh, and he's appeared at numerous uh, cartooning workshops and conventions around the country. He's the former uh, founder and executive director of the Cartoon Art Museum in Pittsburgh. And he's the visiting resident cartoonist at the Charles Schultz Museum in Santa Rosa, California. So Joe is gonna be talking a little bit about his workflow. Uh, he'll probably do a little bit of drawing for us as well because after all, that's why we're here. And uh, welcome Joe and take it away. All right, well, hello everybody. Uh, welcome, my name is Joe Wos. I see a lot of, I'm, I'm looking at the list of attendees. I see a lot of familiar names of, um, uh, some of the uh, students who take my regular classes on my YouTube channel at howtotune.com. Uh, I see some Facebook friends, some fellow artists. So welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, so glad to have you all here. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, how I became a cartoonist, um, my process, and some of the things that I do. And uh, I'm going to actually start off with just a little bit of background uh, on myself. I started drawing when I was four years old, my parents caught me drawing on the walls with a crayon. Now, they didn't get mad, they didn't scream, they didn't yell. Um, what they did was they taped paper up on the walls and said, go ahead. And I have been drawing ever since. I started drawing professionally, getting paid as a cartoonist when I was about 14 years old. Um, I would draw at festivals, um, at uh, parties, I would draw at county fairs and things like that. I would draw caricatures uh, quite badly. Uh, in fact, I'm very embarrassed anytime someone still has a caricature I drew of them 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, but I kept at it. Um, I loved drawing. My hero was Charles M. Schultz, uh, the creator of Snoopy. And, and that's really what got me into doing this is I wanted to be a cartoonist like my hero, Mr. Schultz. I was a big fan of Snoopy. And I was a fan of all cartoons and um, I kept with it. And that's sort of the biggest thing is uh, it takes a lot, a lot of persistence and perseverance uh, to be a, a, a cartoonist. Uh, I have two stories that I like to tell that um, sort of define um, my philosophy, I guess, of art and cartooning. The first one was when I was, um, oh goodness, I was in kindergarten. And I had a teacher named Mr. Weaver. Mr. Weaver was my art teacher. Uh, we had an art teacher who would visit in twice a week. 
And Mr. Weaver collected cartoon art. He loved cartoons. And um, as I said, he was the art teacher. And we had an assignment for our parent teacher day. And the assignment was to draw what we wanted to be when we grew up. Now, at the time, I was only about five years old. I was in kindergarten. I might've been a little younger than five. I think I was a little young. Um, and I really wanted to be, uh, at that time, I wanted to be like my dad. And my dad was a steel worker. He worked in a steel mill. But back then in the 1970s, when you would point to the steel mill, you could see it from our house. We lived up on a hill and he'd point across the valley and there was the mill. But all you would see back then was smoke. Uh, we had a lot of pollution back then. Uh, so that's all you would see was the smoke. And uh, my dad, uh, whenever I'd say, where do you work? He'd say, I work in the powerhouse, the mill. I thought, that's so cool. My dad makes power. Everybody wants power. My dad makes it. That's so cool. So we were assigned to draw what we were going to do when we grew up, where we wanted to work. And he told us, make it beautiful, lots of colors, take your time. You have the full 45 minutes to work on it for the class. We're going to display these in the hallway. And uh, I took one piece of paper and a black crayon, and I just covered it. I just scribbled all over it. I drew all that smoke. That was all I could remember. All I could see is that smoke. So I covered the page in just black crayon scribbles. And I turned it in to the teacher, and he screamed at me. He yelled at me. What are you doing? You can't follow instructions. Why don't you listen? You should be ashamed. Your parents are going to be so disappointed. And, um, and that was it. That was, uh, I, I, I was heartbroken. And later that night, my, my parents showed up, and um, my drawing wasn't up on the wall. And my parents asked, you know, the teachers, why, you know, we noticed all the other drawings, and Joe's a, a great artist, and he likes to draw. Um, where's his drawing? And the teacher, you know, was very disappointed. He said, your son was supposed to draw what he wanted to be when he grew up. And he drew this, and he held up the paper with all the scribble on it. And my dad took one look at it and said, that's the still mill. How could you live in Pittsburgh and not know that's a still mill? And he yelled at the teacher for not being able to see that that was a mill. And uh, my mom thought it was funny. My dad actually thought it was pretty funny because that's what I saw. And my dad always had this unique ability to see, see the world through the eyes of a child in many ways. He, was, he had that great vision to be able to see the, the world with a certain innocence. And um, the teacher did apologize. And, but something big happened in that very moment. In that moment, right then, right there, my whole world changed because I decided I wasn't going to be a mill worker. My dad didn't want me to be anyhow. I decided in that moment I was going to be a cartoonist. And for a very specific reason. One, I loved cartoons. I always loved cartoons, and I knew I could draw them. But um, I was going to be a cartoonist because Mr. Weaver collected cartoon art. And I was going to become a famous cartoonist so that someday he would ask me for my autograph and I would be able to say no. Um, sometimes uh, in life, we succeed not in spite of people, but to spite people. And so I decided to become a cartoonist and I drew every day. And then about- So here, here's the question, did, uh, did Mr. Weaver, did you ever run into Mr. Weaver? I did uh, about 15 years ago. I was invited back to Ben Fairless Elementary where I attended. I was invited back to speak there. Um, I, was, I do assembly programs where I draw stories as I tell them. So I travel all over the world performing these assembly programs and the school had invited me to perform. Um, and Mr. Weaver was still there. And uh, I got to meet him again. The principal introduced me and I said, you don't remember me, but, and I told him that whole story of what happened. And we laughed about it and everything. And, and then I went on to do my show and all the kids were clapping at the end of the show. And Mr. Weaver was standing next to the principal as I came off the stage. And um, uh, Mr. Weaver, the principal came, shook my hand and said, thank you so much. What a wonderful show. We're so proud of you. You know, you've gone on, you've, you've, you've you know, found such success and so glad to have you as a, a, one of our alumni. And Mr. Weaver looked at the principal and said, I taught him everything he knows. 
And, you know, in a funny way, he's right, because I probably wouldn't have become a cartoonist had I not um, done that. But the best part of that story is right before I left, uh, Mr. Weaver asked if he could have my autograph. And I said, no. <laughs> so I didn't give him the autograph. I ended up mailing him a drawing about a week later <laughs> because I felt bad. But I did at least get to say my no to him. So that was really the formation of, of when I decided, the moment I decided I was going to be a cartoonist. And uh, I kept doing it. I kept doing it. And uh, about, goodness, seven years ago, when my, my oldest daughter was, she was seven years old at the time, a, um, one of my old middle school teachers uh, had sent a stack of drawings I had done in middle school. It's amazing how many of my teachers kept my drawings. They knew something I didn't, I think. And they kept all my drawings and, and sent it to me. And I looked at them, and these are drawings I had done in fifth grade. And I showed them to my daughter because I wanted to encourage my daughter and say, see, you know, you learn, you get better. And my daughter looked at my drawings and said, why did you become an artist? And I said, what did you mean? She said, well, you weren't very good. And I said, no, in truth, I wasn't very good. But I didn't know I wasn't very good because I had people who encouraged me and I knew I was going to keep getting better until one day, probably 30 years later, probably wasn't that long ago, I finally got to the point where I was as good as I actually thought I was when I was a kid. And it took a long time to get to that point. I'm still learning. I'm still getting better. People always ask me, what's your favorite drawing? What's your best drawing? And I always had the same answer, the one I do tomorrow, because I'm going to be a hundred times better um, each and every day. I get constantly, I'm constantly improving and constantly getting better at this. And I don't know where I'll be in 20 years, but I know I'll still be drawing and my work will continue to improve. So that's where the two question. Go we ahead, have a Doug. question from a fan. Uh, uh, have you ever met Mr. Schultz? Did you ever meet him when he was, when he was so alive? I'm, I'm sorry to say I never met Charles M. Schultz. Um, uh, about um, 18 years ago, when I was touring around the country, I was touring all over, um, the person who became the education director of the Charles M. Schultz Museum at the time had met me in Ohio. He said, I'm a, are you a fan of Schultz? I said, oh, yeah, I'm a huge fan. And he said, I'm applying for a job there. And when I get the job, you're going to be the first person I hire. And I said, okay, thanks, kid. I'll see you. And sure enough, he got the job. And they asked me to send out a bunch of my work. And I sent out some of the videos of me performing. And they said, can you come out for the opening of the museum? And I did. Um, and I've been their resident cartoonist at the Schultz Museum for 18 years. Um, Jeannie Schultz is a very good friend. Um, uh, everyone at the museum is like family to me. I visit there every year, twice a year. I'll be out there uh, in July. I'll be out there for a week teaching classes. I'll be there and I spend every Thanksgiving. So I have a real Charlie Brown Thanksgiving every year. Um, but sadly, I, I never got to meet Charles M. Schultz. I've met a lot of my heroes. Uh, Sergio Aragones, who I, I just love and is one of the coolest guys. And, and um, you know, a lot of the guys from Mad Magazines and, and new heroes all the time. Um, there are young artists coming up who I admire so much because of their work. They're 30, 40 years younger than me in some cases, but I love their work so much that I'm a fan. They're my heroes. So um, I never met Schultz, but I've, I've met a lot of my, my heroes. So, so great question. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I pursued cartooning, but from a lot of different paths. Um, and that's always been the interesting thing is there's an old saying that I came to a fork in the road and I chose the path less traveled, the road less traveled. Um, I feel that I came to a fork in the road and right in the middle of the road, there was just wilderness and a bunch of weeds and I just took a machete and I made my own path. So I didn't choose one of the two obvious paths. I just created my own. So my, my career as a cartoonist, I've never been a traditional cartoonist. I, I've never done a comic strip or um, I've done a handful of children's books, but I've done things like live performance cartooning. I do symphony performances where I perform with the symphony orchestra and I draw while I'm on stage performing with the music. And then most of all, probably what I'm best known for are my mazes, uh, my cartoonist mazes or maze tunes. And that's been a part of my life since I was about seven years old. In the 1970s, again, when I was growing up, mazes were kind of this phenomenon. 
And, uh, and thankfully, I think they're starting to catch on again. We've, we've all been sort of locked inside and mazes give us something to do and keep the mind sharp. And uh, so I've always drawn mazes and I've always sort of just come back to them and I'll, I'll come back and start drawing them again. And um, what happened with the syndication was for 10 years, I was running a cartoon museum in Pittsburgh called the Toonsium. And I was hanging other people's art on the walls. I, I loved doing it. We did, I, I, I curated hundreds of exhibits, brought in hundreds of guests and it was wonderful. But about eight years in, I started thinking, boy, I've really gotten off track. Um, I'm supposed to be a cartoonist and I'm, I'm too focused on all this other stuff. And so I decided to leave the Toonsium and um, reconnect to um, my maze work. And uh, uh, months had gone by and I hadn't done anything. And um, I decided, okay, this is it. It was one night, it was a Friday night at about, I don't know, 10 p.m. I decided that's it, I'm doing this. I'm gonna become a syndicated cartoonist. Uh, so I sat up that night and I thought about what I could do and I thought, well, I'll do my mazes. Uh, so I, I put together a package. I did, in one night, I drew 25 daily mazes, which are the smaller mazes like this, and uh, I think four Sunday mazes, which are my larger mazes. And I looked at, online to the syndicates and I sent it out to, I think, creators uh, and King Features. And then I was gonna mail out on Monday to all the other syndicates. And immediately after sending it, I, I had stayed up 24 hours straight doing this. I immediately regretted it because I thought, oh no, I didn't do it the right way. I didn't follow the proper format. I, I completely messed up. And I started contacting my, my cartoonist friends in the National Cartoonist Society. Like, how bad did I mess up? Am I gonna be in trouble? Is it is gonna hurt? And they all told me the same thing. They said, don't worry. Nobody gets accepted on their first try. In six months, you'll get a rejection letter. If they like it, they'll give you some pointers for how to improve it. So I submitted on Friday, uh, actually Saturday morning. And then by Monday, I got a phone call from the creator syndicate saying, we love it. We want to syndicate your work. And that was it. I became a syndicated cartoonist. That was on uh, May 4th, five years ago. And I've been drawing ever since. So um, that, that's really how the syndication started. And then from the syndication, I started doing uh, books. Um, I started working with um, uh, BES, uh, which was Barron's Publishing at the time. And um, they did my first book, which was Amazing Animals. Let's see if I can find it. Here we go. Amazing Animals. Now this book, um, I was still drawing by hand. And then I would scan in and um, I would color them on my Wacom tablet. Um, I think at that time I was using one of the Android based tablets. Um, so I would color them all, I would scan them and color them all in. Same thing with my syndication at that time. I was drawing by hand, scanning in, coloring, and it took some time. Um, same thing with my second book. I was still doing by hand and then scanning in. Second book was Myths and Monsters. So all the coloring done on computer, all the drawing done by hand. And then I got a, um, I, think it, I think it was, I can't remember exactly which Wacom tablet it was, but it completely changed my life because I suddenly felt more comfortable drawing on the tablet. It was the right format, the right size. And I started changing, I'll go through a little bit what I do as far as that process, sort of changing the pen tools that I use and I ended up being able to replicate exactly what I was looking for. So by the time I was on my fourth book, or Mesozoic, my whole workflow had converted over to entirely digitally. So these are all done on the computer uh, using my Wacom tablet. And then the coloring is done on the computer. Everything, this entire book, all the illustrations were done on that. Uh, when I did Amazing America, it was all computer. Um, and then the books both got translated into Korean, uh, which was really cool. That was a neat experience. Um, so it, it really, um, my style has evolved thanks to the tablet. Um, so I, I see somebody asking, how did I develop my style? Uh, your style as an individual is actually the combination of every style you've ever encountered and loved. And then what happens is, as you take a little, it's all chemistry. 
So there's a little bit of Charles M. Schultz. There's a little bit of Sergio Aragonez in my work. There's a little bit of M.C. Escher. There's a little bit of all these artists, a little bit of um, the filmation stuff, um, uh, Lou Scheimer. There's a little bit of Disney. There's a little bit of everything. And then slowly what happens is little pieces from each of those go into that recipe. And then suddenly your own style starts to emerge. The biggest breakthrough for me in my career was when I started working on the Wacom tablet. And the reason being is suddenly tools that have been inaccessible to me, tools that I was not skilled at using. I'm not, very, I'm not skilled at using a fountain pen with a nib. I can't do it. I'm not skilled at using a brush. But I could replicate those tools digitally and no one ever knew the difference. So that being able to access those tools on a digital platform and a digital medium really changed my career and changed your style. One of the things I, I tell uh, students again and again is when you're looking for your style, change your tools. And you may discover your style is completely different using a felt tip pen versus using a brush and go through on if you have access to a tablet, download as many different brushes as you can and experiment with each of them. Draw the same character a hundred times with a different each brush each time and your style will really start to emerge. So uh, that's sort of how I developed my style for that. Hey Joe, uh, why don't you uh, take us through a little bit of drawing? I think you're gonna do one of your dailies, right? Yeah, so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch over. Uh, well, first I'm gonna show you sort of my setup. Sure. And, and then uh, I will switch over to um, my screen here, okay? So I'm gonna switch my cameras here. So you're gonna get an aerial view of my workspace. Okay, so you can see my monitor back here. And that's on an arm, so I can push that out of the way. Um, I am using uh, the Wacom One, which I like a whole lot. Um, it is just a, a great product. Um, low price, not expensive at all, um, and very accessible. And for me, one of the things I like about it is uh, the keys that are on the side of most tablets are great because they give you access to all the different functions that you need. But I'm a very visual person. So what I've done is I'm, I, I don't have keys on this one, but I have a, um, a screen deck. And what that allows me to do is have access to little images um, of all my keys. And I can change that according to things. So my cut and paste is here and my fill tool, my paintbrush and so forth, okay? All right, so, and then I have uh, my tablet here, keyboard, uh, and then just the usual mess you see at an artist's desk. And then of course, microphone, which isn't necessary for the drawing, but uh, I use because I, um, uh, I do a lot of voiceover work. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, there we go, desktop two. All right, um, hopefully you, does everybody see, do you see my uh, Photoshop here? Yes. Great, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually open up uh, one of my, uh, my daily template. So to do that, I'm gonna go, uh, let's see. So I go into my templates here, I go open, my desktop, so you can see my desktop is a mess. So many different files, and then I have a daily template. Okay, so I'm gonna use that one there. Oh, so um, I work in a couple layers. Uh, I've got the box, which is literally the, the frame around things, so that's the actual box. Sorry, I'm moving my mic. So that's the actual box. And then I've got my signature panel. I don't sign the dailies over and over. The Sundays I actually re-sign. And then I've got my copyright and my website and then the date. And then this file background, which is usually I'll work in that or I'll add a layer, all right? Um, I work in, a, I use a brush that's called a Belgian. And I work at about 20 points on the brush. And I'll work on that layer one, set that over here. And the first thing I do is just what you would think you would do in a maze. I would start with the start. For the dailies, I just use a letter S and a circle. And then what I'll do is I start building out the maze itself by adding the paths. And the key to mazes 
is you're constantly keeping your options open as you build out the paths. And somebody's asking if you're working on a on a Wacom display right now, and I'm saying yes. <laughs> yes, I, this is a uh, this is the Wacom One, is what I'm working on. Um, I'll, uh, the pen I like to use this one comes with it, and I use a felt tip uh, nib that I add to it, um, which gives me a nice grip um, because I'm just using a felt tip pen, so I like that. I don't like to have it sliding around the screen. I like to have a little bit of a grip to it. So what I'm doing is I'm just sort of continuing these paths and I'm gonna pick which one is gonna be my main path and then I'll close off some of the others. What's unique about my drawings is my mazes are actually illustrated. So I'll work characters into the maze. So in this case, I haven't really given any thought what I'm gonna do. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll pull from national holidays. If it's National Hamburger Day, on that particular day, I'll draw a hamburger. National Dance Like a Chicken Day, I'll draw a chicken. Sometimes if it's the 100th anniversary of something that I'm celebrating, I'll, I'll put it in there. Uh, and then sometimes it's just random creatures. So we're just gonna draw a random sort of monster in here, I think. And how far, how far in advance do you have to do these, Joe? So um, my Sundays have to be about two months ahead. My dailies are supposed to be four weeks. Um, in reality, I work about two to three weeks for my dailies. Um, just because I have a, a other stuff that I'm doing. Um, you know, right now I'm working on, I've got six books I'm working on right now, plus the syndication. So what I'm doing is I'm adding three eyes, but what you notice is these gaps in the drawings. There's always these little gaps, and there's a reason for them. Each of those gaps is a potential path. So I'm going to add a horn in here. horn here. Now you'll see this is my first connection here and I'm going to explain that in a second. Okay, so now I've got a connection for the path into the drawing. All right, so right here this becomes part of the path the drawing. So I'm going to actually close this part off and then these paths now are going to become dead ends because I don't need them anymore. All right, now I've got to decide where this path is going to go through. So I'm going to add some. I'm going to add, uh, we still there, everybody? Oh, yeah, we're here. Oh, good. I heard something yeah. say recording it stopped. But... All right, so then um, I'm adding some teeth. And I'm going to add some eyebrows here. So this horn now becomes part of the path. And I can go through the center eye or this far eye. I think I'm going to use the center eye as my main path. And then this eye, I'm going to actually have it come around to a dead end in the horn. Okay. And I'm closing off another path here for this part of the body. And then I'm adding the body, I'm adding tentacles here. Uh, one of the things people notice a lot about my work is I don't erase a lot. I don't pencil in first. I just start drawing and hope it comes out the way I like. If there's something I don't like, I certainly can erase, but I rarely do it. All right. so. This is my main path. Now what I'm going to do is this is where I'm, I'm basically trying to connect to one of these paths here. So I call this my one true path. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start working backwards from the finish. One of the things about mazes is people cheat all the time and they do mazes. And what they do is they start from the finish and then work their way backwards. So what I do is I cheat. I draw part way from the start, and then I draw the rest of the way from the finish. Now what I am going to do is I'm going to open up a little gap right here. Just that one little gap right there. All right, then I'm going to keep coming around here. 
So what I've got to do is I've got to connect right here to right here. But I don't want to just make it too direct the path. Okay, now what I do, so now I have a complete path. That's a completely solvable maze uh, at this point. So now I'm just sort of adding a couple little designs. Uh, maybe I decide to give them polka dots. And somebody was actually asking you about coloring your mazes. How do you, how do you go about that? So I'm gonna show that next. So what I'll do is I, I, I've got all these, so I have to do two versions of every maze because some newspapers only run in black and white and some run in color. So what I have to do is I have to have a black and white version. This is pretty much what my black and white version would be. Um, I mean, I'm gonna, what I could do is I could do a fill like this, um, but I think I wanna actually have that be a color fill just to give a full demonstration. So now I'm done. I'll actually flatten, flatten the image. And then I have to save it as, and I save it to my desktop. Um, I have to save it sp a very specific code. So I have to do all that. And I have to make sure I label it as a line file, not the color file. And then I save it as a TIFF. Okay. So that would be my, my black and white daily. Then I go image mode and I convert it to, uh, I'll, in this case, I'll do it an RGB. Um, Sometimes I do it as a CMYK. Uh, let's see, let me do it. Maybe I'll do this one as a CMYK. Um, and it sort of de depends on whether it's gonna be for web or for print. And then I have to duplicate my layer. And then I'm gonna basically select all the white and clear that out. And then I work on this bottom background layer. The first thing I'm gonna fill in is going to be my start and finish. My start, I always color code as yellow. And then my finish, I color code as red. The reason I do that is so that, and sometimes I make mistakes. Um, the reason I do that is because if little kids are solving the maze, they might not know their letters or numbers or or if it's from different languages or so forth. So I just keep it simple, S and F, and then the, it's color coded. And then I'm gonna go ahead and do in my, um, my fill. Um, I'm gonna go with a sort of a purple. So all these little interior spaces, I'm gonna just sort of fill in with some color fields. Then I have to actually color that behind there because it didn't fill. All right. Oops. That's the biggest mistake I tend to make over and over is I, um, if I don't close off a section completely, the fill will sort of spread throughout. Now I'm gonna color my monster. I'm gonna give him a pink nose and I'm gonna make him just sort of a green. And what I'm doing here is I'm blocking out all the areas that I want just green. And then I'll fill all those in. So there we go. Oh. Let's see where I missed, little gap there. Okay. And then I'll just do a little touching up. And then I'm gonna go with a different shade of green for the top of the nose here. And I'm gonna go with some color in the eyes. I think I'm gonna go with uh, three different colors. I'm gonna go with a yellow. Let's see, let me turn on my anti this. And then uh, a blue. And Joe, while you're while you're drawing there, I think we're I think we're going to give away a, a tablet right now. Oh, fantastic! To to a lucky uh, viewer, and uh, I don't know, Pete, if Pete Pete Dietrich, who is working behind the scenes, if you could drop their name at the chat, um, then I can uh, 
maybe uh, say hello and have them uh, send me their uh, shipping address. I'll give them my email address and then they can. Yeah, that send would be me. great. All right. So somebody's going to be a lucky winner of a tablet. So lucky you. I, I love, like I said, I love this. The, the, ta the Wacom tablets really has, they've given me my career. Um, you know, I can point to that stories about moments in my life when, you know, our defining moments, whether it was becoming the resident cartoonist at Charles M. Schultz Museum or, you know, interacting with Mr. Weaver or whatever it is. But one of the real defining moments that gave me the career I have was the minute I decided I was going to embrace drawing digitally. Um, that really was one of the key moments in my career. So this is uh, okay. So there it is, yeah. uh, Lisa. Lisa Covington. Uh, great. Lisa, congratulations. Hey, Lisa, if you're listening, drop me an email at douglas.little at wacom dot com and uh, give me your shipping address, phone number, and email, and I'll get a tablet sent off to you. And Joe knows I'm good for it. Yes, he is. Doug is uh, and and Wacom have always. Um, uh, when I run the drink and draws, they supply prizes for the drink and draws. They've supplied prizes for um, my class. So they've, they're, they're fantastic to work with. So absolutely love it. So, all right. So this is, I mean, that's the, the color. All right. And then the last thing I think I've got to do here is the eyebrows. Um, you know, and it, this is actually the funniest thing about sort of when I say Wacom changed my career, what it really did was one of the biggest things it did first was it made me feel comfortable coloring. I hated coloring my work. I absolutely hated it. Um, markers would smear, paint would <laughs> drip. I just couldn't, I wasn't comfortable coloring. But once I switched to digital, it was fantastic. A lot of it has to do with me being left-handed. So the next thing I do is I add one more layer here. This is my shading layer. And, um, I started shading because uh, a friend of mine, uh, Terry Liebenson, who is a fantastic cartoonist, she did a comic strip called Pajama Diaries. She has a series of best-selling uh, books um, with Invisible Emmy. Um, I noticed how great her stuff looked just with a little bit of shading. And I, and I asked her, I said, well, what's the point? Because does the newspaper, will the shading even show up? And she said to me, well, it doesn't matter if it shows up in the newspaper. I think it looks great. <laughs> so I, I realized, well, I'd rather be happy with my own work and it shows up online. And a lot of um, readers and viewers are online now anyway. So so I always add in now just a little bit of shadow. It adds maybe a minute or two to my work, but um, it does make a really big difference, um, at least to me. I like, I like how the work looks when I just add a, a little bit of shadow in here and there. And the, the shadow is, you know, opacity of 49% in a layer. And then I select the same color of whatever I'm shading. And then I just darken it down about halfway. And I really just eyeball it. I mean, you know, there are lots of rules you follow in cartooning or art of the proper way to do things. And it's important to know them. But I always say the best thing about cartooning is once you know the rules, you're allowed to break them, but you got to learn them all first. So, so there we go. Last thing I'll sort of do is I'll go back and I'll just sort of pick some, what I call false um, fields. So these are one little fields that just sort of color fields that um, weren't necessarily blocked off originally but I want to add them in just to mislead a little bit. And then I flatten my image, file, save as, and this one gets saved as color. And that one gets saved as a JPEG. And that's it. So that's, um, that's my basic process for, uh, for doing a daily. Uh, the Sundays, pull up a Sunday here. In fact, I just did one this morning. You can't tell anybody you saw it though, everybody. So 
keep it quiet. So this is a Sunday. This will run on August 2nd. That's, that's great. <laughs> so that's just, it's a pretty simple one. This one took probably about 40 minutes total time. So I worked pretty, pretty quick. All right, so let me switch on back here. All right, and let me switch cameras from my aerial view. There we go. All right, so that's sort of a, a, a basic of, of my process and, and how I use um, the, the Wacom tablet. Um, I pair it up, as I said, I paired up with something called a stream deck, which so I can have lots of these buttons that I can access. Um, and then I have the large monitor. Um, I'm usually viewing my uh, work directly on the tablet. So the monitor I'm usually using for reference material, um, tracking my database, stuff like that. I also have an iPad right here on an arm that I'll use for reference too, if I need to pull in something really close. And by reference, it might be most things I just sort of intuitively know how to draw. If somebody says draw, you know, a rabbit in a tutu, well, something in the back of my brain says, okay, this is what a rabbit in a tutu would look like. But every now and then I'll need to know a specific pose or a specific type of animal or something that I need to pull up a photo of to work from um, so I can see it. So I have, you know, I try and keep that um, very accessible to me. So that's uh, my workflow. That's a little bit uh, about my career. Um, I'd like to take some time to uh, talk to you about what I'm working on now. Uh, and then I'll give you a chance to ask any questions uh, you might have, okay? So what am I working on now? Well, I do my syndication every day. I work on a few mazes. The way I work is I like to try and get um, dedicate a couple days to do all my work for the week. So I usually do about a week's worth of work in one day. So I draw up about seven mazes in one day. Um, it might sometimes take me two days to color them all and everything, but usually about a day, day and a half, I have my work done for the week. Uh, I teach a daily class at howtotune.com. I see many of my students are here today. Welcome. Uh, I also am right now working on, as I said, I've got six different books I'm working on. Some I can tell you about, some I can't. Um, one is, uh, excuse me, actually four of them are, we're taking a lot of my daily mazes and we're going to package them into uh, a new product called Minute Mazes. So each maze takes less than a minute to solve. Um, I'm also working on a book of mazes that'll feature all the national parks. There'll be 50 national parks as mazes. That one's coming out next year. Uh, and then let's see if I can tell you about the other one I can't tell you about, but uh, I'm also writing uh, a children's book for a middle reader that's going to be about Benjamin Franklin. And that's one I'm very excited about. So I don't do just mazes. I do other kinds of illustration. Uh, I do have lots of projects I do freelance work for. So I'm doing a project for a website, website right, right now, designing all the characters and logos for it. Uh, but most of my stuff that I do, 90% is stuff that is mine. Um, they're either my books or my syndication, but the things that are really um, just strongly connected to just my work, they remain mine. I maintain most of the rights to my work too. So um, it's very important to me that I stay connected to it. So. Um, let me, um, uh, Doug, can we, we take some questions? So we got about 15 minutes. Sure. Or so I wanted to go ahead and take questions. If that's all right with you. Sure. Uh, somebody's asking, um, you know, what, what tablet you, ta what tablet you use and what would you recommend probably for a beginner? I think, I think we have a lot of beginning tablet users or yeah, people a lot that of young never used a tablet. So this is the really cool thing. All right. The tablet I would recommend is the one that is for lack of better words, it's for, it, it's for beginners and people starting out, but I'm a professional of, you know, I've been doing this my whole life and I love it. And that is the Wacom One. Um, it is a great tablet. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of the bells and whistles and buttons and knickknacks and so forth that some of the other ones do, but you really don't need that starting out. You need the basics and the basics are something to draw on and something to draw with. Um, so this is the pen. If you're just starting out, it's a nice form factor. So it feels like you're using a regular pencil or marker. Some of the other tablets, uh, um, that you might use the, the upgrades might have a little bit thicker pen 
and it takes some getting used to. Someone just starting out, this is the kind of pen you're going to want to use. Um, it has a nice flow onto the screen. It's a pretty decent sized screen. I like it. It's perfect for both my dailies and my Sundays. And uh, it's at an, what I would say, an entry level pricing. The pricing is fantastic on it. Um, it is less than what you would pay for a high end iPad. Um, and you're getting a much better product for what you want to do, which is drawing. And this plugs right into your computer, whether you use a Mac or a Windows computer. And then you can use whatever your favorite um, drawing software is. I do use Photoshop, um, but there are lots of other great um, uh, so pieces of software out there, whether you want to get into animation or um, traditional drawing, whatever it is, there's software out there for you. So I highly recommend this. Um, you can, I, I believe they have some offers available uh, for those who have been um, tuned in, uh, some discounts available for these. So check that out too. Uh, somebody's asking if um, Wacom's can be used on the, on the internet. Um, oh, uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's the nice thing is you can use this in lots of different kinds of software. So if you are someone who's drawing um, online, you're using your, your whether it's, um, you know, in some of the gaming software out there that you, you're using drawing um, or you're doing shared drawing with your friends, um, you can use it, yeah, with anything. Even if you're just, you know, I honestly, I use it for so much stuff. I don't sign, print up and sign things anymore. I, I just sign and, and write everything out on my Wacom tablet. If I'm taking notes, I do it on here. I do everything I would on here. The key to this is though, is you do need to make sure you have it hooked up to a computer, but you can use um, everything. So it's a little, for some of my younger audience, um, the main thing you need to keep in mind is this is a tool, okay? It's a tool, it's something you use to draw, all right? And in order to use the tool, it does have to be hooked up to your computer, all right? So that's what enables you to access the internet or access the software and so forth, okay? So it's just, a, it's a tool that you hook up and uh, it's one that I highly recommend. Great, great, yeah. And obviously somebody's asking, because of the shirt you're wearing, I assume you made that shirt, correct? Yes, I, I design all my own, uh, well, it is mostly all my own clothing. Um, and it started out as, because I was doing so many appearances at Comic-Cons and stuff. Um, and I would always wear like Superman or Spider-Man. And then, and then I decided, wait a minute, why am I promoting all this stuff for DC and Marvel? I should promote my own stuff. So uh, yeah, so I do my own things. And this, is, and this is all, this particular one is all my, a bunch of my Sundays. And every one of these was drawn on uh, a Wacom tablet. So there's about 20 different mazes on this shirt. I have some other ones that are just uh, a single maze. So uh, great question, but yes, I do. And uh, oh, I see a question from Alyssa. Alyssa is actually one of the winners of one of the um, uh, tablets uh, that I'm going to be mailing out um, soon. So uh, one, one of the winners from uh, my class. Oh, nice. Yeah. No, I remember that. I remember you yeah. asking me for sure. <laughs> yeah. So what, what advice do you have for youngsters uh, trying to get into comic art? I mean, should they... Uh, go to school somewhere? Should they, should they practice all the time? I mean, what are some of the tips and tricks for kids? So, um, and, and this applies to kids. It applies to adults. Um, one of my favorite things is when I was teaching cartooning about 25 years ago, I had, and I taught mostly kids and teenagers, and I had a gentleman who was 70 years old who had just had a stroke, and his doctor told him, he should do crossword puzzles and just try and keep his mind sharp. And he said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to be a cartoonist. Had never drawn a day in his life. And all of a sudden he wanted to be a cartoonist at 70 years old. And he asked if he could sit in on my classes and I allowed it. And um, I would do some workshops with him, some one-on-one -on -one stuff. And within two years, he was doing caricatures professionally. And <laughs> last time I saw him, he was like 85 years old and just loving life drawing caricatures. Um, that's what he, that he found his passion. So what are some of the points I, uh, pointers I give? One is draw, draw all the time. Um, if you don't have uh, a tablet and I recommend you get one, but if you don't have one, 
get a stack, a ream of copy paper and just draw constantly. Um, whenever you have free time, draw and draw whatever. Um, that's one of the things that you really need to learn is to draw really random things. Because when you're a cartoonist, one week you are drawing a dancing chicken, but the next week you're drawing a lamppost. Uh, you might be drawing a toaster. You have no idea what you're going to do. So learn to draw everything around you. Uh, take in everything around you. Uh, learn to just sort of uh, become a consumer of cartoon art because your style is ultimately going to be the combination of all these other styles. So uh, if you want to be a comic book artist, read comic books. If you want an animator, be an animator, watch animation. If you want to be a video game des designer, play video games. It's one of the best ways to learn is by observing others. Um, go on YouTube, watch lots of classes, sign up for my classes, um, you know, uh, attend more of these uh, wonderful seminars from Wacom. Uh, learn as much as you can. Do you have to go to school? Well, you have to go to school um, for, for some things and not for others. Um, I didn't go to school for cartooning. Uh, I went to school, I was a history major because I loved history and I use it all the time in my work. Uh, but if you want to be an animator, I recommend going to school for that. If you want to be a video game designer, I recommend doing that. If you want to be a comic book artist or a comic strip artist or an editorial cartoonist, I recommend just drawing all the time. Um, start now. I mean, this is the one thing that people have to keep in mind. People say, what does it take to be a cartoonist? And the answer ultimately comes down to this. Do you draw cartoons? And if you answered yes, then you're a cartoonist. So your question should be not, what does it take to be a cartoonist? Because chances are, you already are a cartoonist. Your question should always be, what will it take for me to become a better cartoonist? And it's a question I answer each and every day. What is it going to take for me to become better at what I do? What would it take to make this drawing better? What would it take to make my tools better? I'm constantly looking for ways to improve. Um, as I've said, one of the biggest improvements I make and I make every few years is by upgrading my equipment that I use to draw. And that actually does help me improve as an artist. And that's something simple you can do is changing up your equipment and it, and it helps improve things. But by drawing every day, uh, constantly learning, you're a lifelong learner, just remember, if you draw cartoons, you are a cartoonist. So the question is always, how do I become a better cartoonist? Okay? Great That's question. Great. Thanks, Joe. Um, hey, you're, we all know you're a member of the National Cartoonist Society as well. Can you talk a little bit to the audience about that as well? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the National Cartoonist Society is an organization of professional cartoonists. Um, from all over the nation and, and a few from uh, around the world. It, is, um, it was one of the great joys of my life is when I was able to join the association because they actually review your work uh, and then you pay a membership fee and you become a part of this uh, fraternal organization of fellow cartoonists. And for a lot of us, um, it's a connection to people who are like-minded and do something that is so unique and so rare um, there's not a lot of cartoonists who work professionally or able to make uh, a living at this. Um, so having that in common, someone you can share stories with, someone you can ask advice is just a great experience. We do um, every year something called the Rubin Awards, which is the highest awards that a cartoonist can receive. And there's multiple categories. Um, I'm very happy to say that for the first time in my life, I am nominated for a silver, silver Rubin Award in the variety category, which covers things like puzzles and mazes and trivia and things like that. Um, so it's a wonderful organization. I'm, I'm like all of us this year, I, I'm sad that I, I don't get to see my friends in person, but we'll be doing some online programming for the Rubens this year and it'll be open to the public. So all of you attending uh, here today um, keep an eye on my social media and I know Wacom will be a big part of it. So keep an eye on their social media and we will announce um, the dates for that. But I know they've got a great lineup of workshops and artists and awards and everything else. So um, in a sense, you can all get to be a part of it this year. 
So it'll be a lot of fun. Cool. That's great. Um, how, how do you, how do you uh, come up with your ideas every day? It must be tough. What, what inspires you? So, um, oh, I'm actually going to see if I can, let me see if I can um, share this. I'll show you my actual, um, how I do is I have actually a database that I keep um, that I, uh, that I've made myself um, using uh, a product called Airtable. And uh, so let me see if I can um, share my database here. I'm going to do share screen again here, everyone, because that'll help me. uh, Okay, so there's my desktop. Yeah, desktop one. There we go. I'm going to switch over to that. Okay, hopefully this is what you see is this little database here. Yep. Does everybody see that? I can see it. Right. So you'll see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things here. All right. So what I do is I, I list, are there any holidays during that day? So we'll go all the way back to January 6, 2020 was National Bean Day. Um, January 9th was Stack Electricity Day. Um, Save the Eagle Days, Arkansas Day, Rubber Ducky Day, Dress Up Your Pet Day, so forth and so on. Um, DeForest Kelly, who was in Star Trek, his 100th birthday, things like that. And then I either draw something related to that or I completely ignore it. Um, So, for example, Bean Day, I don't know why, I decided to draw a beaver. I had nothing for January 7th, so I drew a kid playing baseball. Uh, On the 8th, I drew an abstract design. On the 9th, it was Stack Electricity Day, so I drew something inspiring that was static. And then on the 10th was Save the Eagles Day, so I drew an eagle. Um, Rubber Ducky Day, I drew a rubber ducky. National Hat Day, I drew a hat. National Nothing Day, I did an abstract. Um, For Bootleggers Day and the beginning of Prohibition, I drew a woman named Kate Hester, who was the woman who coined the phrase speakeasy here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So my history, my love of history comes into play a lot um, into these things. So one of the places I get my ideas is from holidays. Another place I get my ideas is from history, um, things I'm reading, looking around the room, going for a walk. The ideas can come from anywhere. I, sometimes I have no idea where they're coming from. But uh, I've gotten pretty organized as far as tracking all my maze. What's nice about it is when I'm working on a book, if they say, oh, we need uh, 10 duck mazes, I can just go into my database, type in duck, and it'll pull up all my duck mazes for that, for that year. Cool. Great. That's, that's cool. <laughs> uh, but how, how about your uh, creative process as well? What, uh, what, what, what kind of things are, do you, do you draw more yeah, often so, than, than others. I mean, I, I know you stick to animals and a lot, a lot of things like that, but is there other things you do? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I do. If you look at my mazes, there, there's a lot of different things in there. There's, there's a lot of, there's human characters. There's, you know, in one day it might be a blender. Honestly, it could be just about anything. Um, I do occasionally do caricature of celebrities in my mazes. Um, so primarily just because I, I've become very focused on the mazes. Um, as, as just the really has become my niche. Um, so that's the most of my work, but I still perform. I still travel all over the country, uh, drawing stories as I tell them, uh, not so much this year, but I perform with symphony orchestras where I illustrate music, um, like Carnival of the Animals and so forth. But my process is, you know, I've often thought about what is my process. And um, I've come to the conclusion that I, I don't have one, but there's some steps that I skip out of pure laziness, I think, to be honest, okay? Most artists will tell you they sit there and they doodle first, and then they'll do a rough sketch, and then they'll do a more finished sketch that's cleaned up, then they'll take it maybe into the computer or light box or trace over it, and then they'll do a final sketch, and then they'll do, you know, they'll ink it and they'll color it and all this stuff. I have always been a what you see is what you get. So if you see me live and I draw a picture with a pen and paper, what, I, what you see is what you get. If I'm working on a computer, again, what you see is what you can get. 
a lot of my pro process, 90% of my process is thinking about what I'm going to draw, not thinking about what it's going to look like or how I'm going to draw it. So a lot of the decision process is deciding, okay, I'm going to draw a summer scene. All right, well, there should be a sun and there should be a whale and then I'm going to have a rain cloud. And I just start drawing. And sometimes the mazes will suggest something, the way a line curves or a path will form a shape and I'll start to see an image in that. But um, there's not a lot of steps in my process. It really is just, I, I like to draw and I like to just get right to it. I don't like to overthink it and overdraw it. Um, I, I, their way, everybody else's way is definitely the better way to do it. It's just that um, my process has always been one of just what you see is what you get. And I've drawn in, I've never drawn in pencil. Um, I draw strictly either in, on my tablet or in marker. Before the tablet, I never erased. If I made a mistake, I would set it aside and start over. Now that I have the tablet, I feel comfortable erasing because I can do it digitally. So uh, another advantage of working digitally is it's still, I get that crisp, bold line, um, but I don't have to pencil sketch first. I don't have to erase over it. So. So most okay. of the time I don't do rough sketches. Sometimes if I have to figure out composition, I will lay in some shapes to show where the dragon's going to be and where the castle's going to be and then draw over top of that. But I don't usually do a rough sketch. Great. Cool. Joe, that's awesome. <laughs> and now that we're at the uh, top of the hour, we have our, our second tablet winner. Um, and uh, it's uh, Janet Totman. So Janet, congratulations. If you, Janet, email me, if you email me um, your shipping address, phone number, and email, I'll get a tablet off to you uh, very, very promptly. So that's great. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, uh, everybody. This has been fantastic. Joe, do you, do you have any uh, closing remarks or, or anything to say? Anything, any advice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, thank you, everybody who tuned in today. Uh, thank you, of course, to welcome for, for having me. As always, you know how much I love working with you guys. Um, we've done a lot of projects together. It's always been fun, and, and I look forward to so many more. Um, I, I recommend if you um, are interested in, or thinking about um, trying out a tablet, um, you know, there, uh, if you're in, uh, I, I know if you're, if you're in Portland, if you're ever in Portland, you've got to go by uh, Wacom's headquarters and they're, um, they, they have this storefront where you can try out all their products. Uh, and it's really cool. They're really cool. It's a really neat place. Um, and they have classes there. So definitely if you're in Portland or if you're ever visiting Portland, definitely check that out. It's awesome. Um, try, the, you know, try the tablets out. I think uh, if, if you've never tried one, you'll end up really enjoying it. It'll really be something that you'll really latch on to quickly. I know that I have a lot of um, younger uh, viewers. So this is something you do intuitively. You are, you know, the digital generation. My generation, we had to learn all this. And there are still a lot of old timers who don't want to do it, who haven't taken up the tablets. And um, there's a lot of reasons to do it. It's, it's really increases your productivity. It allows you to use tools that you might not otherwise be able to use or might not be as accessible to you. It allows you to experiment with different styles and techniques. Um, you can choose thousands of different kinds of brushes. You can do interesting things with the filters and colors. Um, but ultimately, it's all going to come down to that very, very basic skill of something to draw on and something to draw with. Um, my preferred something to draw on is a Wacom tablet. My preferred something to draw with is one of their stylus pens. and. Um, Everybody has something different they like. Uh, try lots of different things. See what works for you. See what works for you and keep drawing. That's the biggest thing I can tell you is never stop drawing. Never give up. You're going to get a lot of rejection in your life. That's part of the job. You're going to get people who don't like your work. You can't make everybody happy. Um, so the best thing you do is try and make yourself happy. All right? Be happy with your own work. Learn to just look at it and go, hey, I like that drawing. A lot of times you look at your drawings and you go a day later, you're like, oh, I don't like that so much. But try and find the things you liked about it, you know, and you're going to keep getting better. Remember, as I said at the very start of the hour, 
your best drawing is going to be the one you do tomorrow. Okay? So keep drawing, everybody, and uh, stay tuned. Be sure and check out all that Wacom has to offer, not just in all their products, which are great, but also all the wonderful uh, workshops and seminars they have to offer both online and eventually once we get through all this Corona stuff, I'm sure that we'll have lots of stuff in person as well. Okay. Thanks everybody so much for being here today. And uh, thank you, Wacom, for hosting me and, and thank you for changing my life with your wonderful tablets. Thanks, Joe. Thanks everybody for joining us. Have a happy Tuesday and stay safe. Bye-bye everyone.